I want to welcome all of you guys to the Street Dog Podcast, brought to you by the Street Dog Coalition. We are an international nonprofit caring for lives on both ends of the leash, and we provide free medical care and related services to pets of people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. I am your host, Daria Tavana, and I'm also the Director of Development at the Street Dog Coalition. If you're joining us live, go ahead and drop an emoji in the comments, say hi, let us know where you're tuning in from, and don't hesitate to ask a question if you feel inspired to at any point in time during this conversation with me and my incredible special guest. So I want you guys to know that on the Street Dog Podcast, we explore the world of animal welfare through the eyes of experts, street dog vets, volunteers, and incredible members of the veterinary community like the guest I have with me today. And we share inspiring stories. We provide updates on our advocacy work. And we give you an inside look, a little peek behind the curtain at the challenges and rewards of working to improve the lives of animals belonging to people experiencing homelessness. So again, if you're tuning in live on Facebook, it is so great to have you here. We really appreciate your support and we love connecting with you in this way. And if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or YouTube, please make sure that you're following the Street Dog Coalition on Facebook so that you can also tune in live every episode. That will allow us to engage with you guys in real time, which we love to do. Okay, so without any further ado, I want to let you guys know that we have an incredibly special guest on today's episode. I have veterinarian and trailblazer, very humble trailblazer, Ken Gorsica with me. So Ken is a nature-based veterinary artist. He is an end-of-life doula and researcher in the healing power of the human-animal bond. He is an advocate of integrating spirituality into the work of veterinary science, something we, we don't see enough of happening. And he believes that many of life's challenges can be answered by nature. And I must admit, it feels weird hosting this interview not outside and inside because <laughs> something about Ken makes me just want to be outside all the time. Ken attended yes. the school exactly of veterinary medicine at UC Davis in the 1980s, and he's a founding member of Pride Ver Veterinary Medical Community and the founding, founding veterinarian for Pets Are Wonderful Support in San Francisco, as well as um, a bunch of other initiatives that we'll be talking about on this episode. His resume is, is very extensive. And he currently works with A Gentle Rest, providing in-home pet euthanasia services and offers his artistic talent to those grieving the opportunity to have their loved ones memorialized through a custom painted portrait. And he encourages people to experience vision fasting, which I think is so cool, where one spends time alone in nature to celebrate life transitions and navigate the complexity of these these times. Um, and Ken will also be able to talk a little bit more about a charity art auction that he's hosting for the Street Dog Coalition. So, ooh, Ken, that was quite the introduction. Go ahead, say hi. <laughs> hey, it's great to uh, be here. I'm, uh, I, 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 I'm excited to share what I can with you guys. And I love the Street Dog Coalition, so I'm really glad to be here. That's fantastic. And I want to thank again, everyone who's tuning in, tuning in live. You guys are really in for a treat. Uh, Ken's background is so diverse. And, and let's just dive right into it, Ken. I'm going to ask you questions like I, like I mentioned before we started recording that had just been on my heart ever since you and I connected. And one of my biggest questions, um, I hope you're comfortable with me calling you a trailblazer and a pioneer multiple times in this conversation. But I know that you've been a pioneer in advocating for a more inclusive and stronger veterinary profession. And I wanna know, maybe could you give us a little bit of a background into what challenges you faced as a gay man during your time at UC Davis, especially during the AIDS epidemic, and maybe how you've kind of seen the profession evolve since your time? Sure. Yeah. If we think back in the early 1980s, it was just, it really was a different world around um, LGBTQ advocacy. I was uh, a young man in, in veterinary school and I uh, was, I just 
came out of the closet actually in my junior year. And so I all of a sudden found myself in this profession um, as a, uh, a gay man. And I didn't really find any role models or any out people within the faculty. So I felt really isolated. And I really wondered even if, if I had chosen the wrong profession because veterinary medicine is very conservative. It's based from the agricultural roots of our society. And, and so um, I really had to go on my own search to find my uh, like-minded people and, and uh, uh, find out how that was going to work. Now, um, I did find other gay people within the uh, other classes. And so I did have a, a small network and, but I had to go outside the school to really find my, um, my support through the, the campus L uh, gay center, let's say. And, uh, but the profession um, has really changed over these years. Uh, I went to Pennsylvania to do my internship in Philadelphia. And I found that in this urban school, there was a very active gay community already. This Dean of Student Services was an out gay man. So there really was another world out there. And so I, I found my uh, my people and I realized that I could be a successful practitioner and and uh, and uh, and also be myself as a gay man. And so I um, at that point, I felt that uh, uh, I had chosen the right profession. It was OK. Um, at, at the same time, it was the AIDS pandemic in 1981 is when when uh, this this um, virus was first first acknowledged in the gay community, uh, and so that was a whole nother uh, arena that all of us were struggling with. And um, because the first several years, there, it wasn't even known what the virus was, or if it was a virus, and there was a lot of uh, miscommunication. And one of the big things for uh, for us was that um, people with AIDS uh, uh, were being told by their physicians that they should get rid of their dogs and cats because of unknown risk of zoonotic diseases. And the truth is you could catch, theoretically catch illness from your pet. And we didn't know what was causing AIDS. So it was prudent maybe to say that, but as a veterinarian uh, or veterinarians, we knew that the pow power of the human on bond was so so necessary, especially when you're, you, you have isolation, you've been uh, perhaps um, uh, ostracized by your family, you lost your job. And so the pets actually might be the only thing that is giving you um, true medicine. And so, um, uh, but getting back to the, uh, the LGBT part of the profession, over the years, we, we created the Lesbian and Gay Veterinary Medical Association, which was an advocacy group started in 1992, I think. And we just started just being at the table. We would go to the meetings and have an annual meeting. And over that decade, we became um, more uh, uh, aware by the profession. And they've, they've over the last decade, I'd say, we become an, an actual partner with with the profession because they realize that that there are gay people uh, in the profession, obviously, and and that we need to be su supportive of everybody. So, it's it's we've come a long way, and we now have um, um, uh, a very active group that supports students as well as um, individuals uh, and creates. We're going to be at the San Francisco um, Gay Pride Parade in uh, next Sunday, and so there's going to be, I think, maybe. Uh, 50 to 75 people marching together, um, celebrating the veterinary community. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. It's, it's so interesting and fascinating for me. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we do at the street dog coalition, I, I think so often we're, we're focused on how behind we are, how much work we have left to do and how, you know, oftentimes, you know, even from an inclusivity perspective, things feel really grim. So I really appreciate this opportunity to look back and think about the 80s and really think about how far, you know, the LGBTQ community, especially, um, you know, in the, the medical community, the veterinary community, has has grown and and evolved over over just just a few decades and i have to say that's of course a testament to individuals like you who are breaking down barriers who are um creating networks of like-minded people that see the value of these human animal connections and understand that these human animal connections uh during periods of uncertainty and during periods of loss are more important than ever so i'm curious to know if someone is listening to this and, um, you know, they are struggling with their own identity right now, and they're also looking for opportunities to 
you know, practice veterinary medicine without sacrificing who they are, without needing to try as to try and and pass as, you know, a straight person or as a man or as a woman. Um, what what advice do you have to someone that is kind of walking in the trail that you blaze, kind of walking behind you, but still trying to figure out their voice and make an impact for animals? Well, I I think, you know, it's really important to try to uh, be your own identity and, and live your true self, you know, and that's that's really important for a, a good quality of life for yourself. Um, surely there's so many more resources now you could you could um, uh, become a member of Pride Veterinary Medical Community. They're, they're off, uh, they have a website and do all these other activities. So that's it's great to find other like-minded people. Um, I think that most veterinary veterinarians and veterinary practices are very open. You know, I mean, it's it's it is a different world, and we all come together, and we all love animals, and we all um, try to accept people. Um, but I, I know that in certain areas, it's still a little bit more difficult. So you just have to be careful and, and find your way. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I think that's really helpful advice for for all of us to hear. And it and it does it does feel good to know that you you were able to um, you know identify a problem in your community and connect with people that also felt that that you know that representation um, and inclusivity was a problem and was holding the community back a bit, and that you were able to. Um, to really overcome that and to find a space that you could call your own. And I, and I really appreciate that. And, and I know that you've, so you've researched, of course, the, the healing power of the human animal bond. And, um, and before, before we kind of talk about that, I, I also know that you are a bit of an expert in terms of the intersection of spirituality and, um, you know, caring for animals, uh, veterinary medicine. So, I'm curious to know, how do you approach this, this topic, the importance of spirituality in the work of veterinary science? How do you approach this, this topic with, with your clients or with sure. other members of the veterinary community? And, and maybe you could kind of give us some insight into the benefits that you've seen from integrating spirituality into your practice. Sure. Well, I'm not an expert. I, I'll say I'm always learning and I'm, I'm, I'm actually a novice at this specific topic, I've always been a, um, a spiritual person in understanding the, the power of nature and, and the, the great um, connection we all have. And that includes animal companions. And, and it's my belief that our, our companion animals are, are one of the last vestiges of nature that we have in our lives, where we used to all live on a farm or in nature. Now we just have uh, sometimes our animal companion, but they offer us such uh, an insight into nature and they give us such a reflection that I think that uh, that's why we all love our animals so much. And um, uh, but in my practice, in my end of life practice is where I find that the spirituality can be important. I mean, the veterinary profession itself does not touch, delve into spirituality. We sort of have a, a separation of, of church and state, so to speak. But um, when an animal is dying or in the dying process, that brings us all into a very uh sacred space just by default you know and and um the way i um try to uh include it, it just in, it is by offering you know when we when we i do home euthanasia so we i, I get to know the animal and the person in their homes at, at, at that time and it's a they've already made the decision that this is the moment for, or the day for their animal to pass because it's it's a really hard thing to let let that beloved animal go but I, I, I try to create a, a safe, good story. I want to create a good story ending for them and their pets so that they uh, don't have to be full of angst or anxiety because a lot of people don't know what to expect. But then I after the animal has passed, then I, I ask them, is it okay if we do a ceremony to acknowledge your uh, the loss of your pet? And so I I um, have been including that in my in, in my uh, practice. And it's and it's not a specific um uh, spiritual belief it's it's more just acknowledgement of this moment you know because everyone can have different perspectives on on what uh their their beliefs here are about dying and, and afterlife and things like that but i i acknowledge it by ringing some bells i can sometimes use um uh, a smudge stick and and have a have a acknowledged that we're separating the spirit from the animal and we and then i i'll usually 
also uh, read a poem or something that really acknowledges the moment and just and then let the person have some quiet time alone with the with their pet I, i've been thinking a lot about how in the human world a lot of there's a lot of practices where you wash your your the body of your human uh, family member or friend and i i was thinking that it would be great to allow people to be brushing their pets or to do something really intimate like that as well so it's an, it's evolving and i'm not sure where it's going to go I, I think that there's a possibility that some veterinarians and i know already do ceremony uh, in this work and and i'm just exploring it so it's um I love it. You know, I think it makes me feel good. It makes the client feel good. And, and surely um, it respects the animal as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I think, um, you know, as someone myself, and I'm sure so many individuals listening um, have had the misfortune of, of, of needing for one reason or another to, to euthanize their companion animal, you know, in, in retrospect and thinking about my experiences, I, I, I really, I, I feel like something was missing in that moment. And, and in all, you know, in, in all seriousness, I didn't know what that thing that was missing in that moment was that moment that I had to put one of my cats to sleep was until hearing you speak into this, hearing you speak into a few of these ceremonial practices, um, some of these conversations you're having, some of the, you know, the environmental shifts you're creating to ease both the animal and the person. And I really hope that individuals who are listening to this, um, you know, kind of may maybe rethink the way in which they might go go about uh, humane euthanasia in the future. I, I didn't know that having an individual like you was even an option for, for me, right? So it's just, it's just really tremendous what you provide for these animals and for these people. And I especially love the idea of you saying that you're always learning, that you are a novice, and that this is a practice that's always, that's always evolving. Um, I think that Part of me sees that that's the spiritual side of you, but also part of me sees that that's the scientific side of you as well, right? Because as scientists, we have to surrender to the evolution of our research, the evolution of our studies, and to kind of always being a student. So, man, I just think that is that is so cool. So cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, of course. Of course. So maybe we can kind of dip a little toe into... Uh, the the healing power of this human animal bond that we at the Street Dog Coalition go on and on about. I know that this is something that you're very interested in um, as well, and something that you are constantly uplifting. So, I'm curious to know: Can you maybe speak a little bit about how how the human animal bond can help those experiencing homelessness? Maybe especially help. Uh, individuals who are members of the of the queer community experiencing homelessness, and maybe, what role do you see veterinarians playing in in addressing homelessness, especially LGBTQ homelessness in in our communities? Sure. Well, uh, let me just step back a little bit. Where I, I first became a human animal bond advocate was during the AIDS pandemic, and when I saw so many of my friends and colleagues uh, or, or clients. Um, uh, were dying or in the dying process because in the early days you died in six months a year and sometimes you see somebody and they would be dead you know that a couple weeks later but I found that um, animal companionship was one of the most powerful medicines that people still had control over if they could if, if they if they could have that in their life and 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 that's where the organization Pets are Wonderful Support came along and realized that people that are sick um, needed help to support their animal. Um, if they go in the hospital, we needed foster care. If they're, um, they needed veterinary care, like the uh, Street Dog Coalition. Um, and uh, we just helped uh, promote the, the value of, of pets for people with AIDS. And there was a lot of education that went into that. And um, uh, because at first we weren't sure what even caused AIDS and, and there were illnesses you could potentially catch from animals. So the doctors were being very cautious and telling their patients to, consider giving up their pet. And as veterinarians, we knew that that was really the wrong um, recommendation because that could be the only thing in their life that was keeping them um, alive and stable. And I see that over and over. But getting back to the Street Dog Coalition, and, and I, I think it's very 
parallel way that of the power that animals can play in people that are uh, dealing with homelessness, you know, because it's the same thing that it's, that it's one of the few things that they have control over in their lives that gives them companionship. And I personally have no problem with, with the homeless person having a pet. I think it's, uh, it's their right as well. As for the um, veterinary profession, I'm, I'm really glad to see gore organizations like the Street Dog Coalition be out there pr uh, providing uh, care as best they can. Uh, in San Francisco, we have the group called Vet SOS, which is uh, was it came out of the the AIDS movement as well, um, and that's where we help uh, people uh, that are homeless with their pets through veterinary clinics and and um, it, uh, helping as best we can. So um, the human, I think, the power is of the human bond is just. I think we all really understood it through the COVID pandemic, and those of us that did have animals realized, oh my God, this is keeping me sane. You know, and and um, so it's uh, yeah, that's that's a synopsis, I guess. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. I, I I'm I'm really excited. I know that you know during during the AIDS uh, epidemic, the loss of life was obviously tr tremendous, and there is an entire generation, right, of of gay men that were not allowed to grow old that, you know, whose lives were cut short. Um, and there's this sage wisdom, I think, that we have really missed out on as as a result of this entire group of individuals, um, you know, smart, passionate, so much to offer individuals were navigating this epidemic. Um, and, and like you mentioned, you know, the prognosis was was not good. A lot of these individuals died well before their prime. So I think that um, to to me, it's just it's it's really inspiring and really important to uplift voices like yours of individuals who were around at that time, who were thriving at that time amidst so much loss and devastation. So um, so you know, just I can only speak for myself personally. I really feel like you are such a, a light in the gay community and the veterinary medicine community. And, uh, and it's just, it's just really exciting and meaningful for, for us at the street dog coalition to uplift your story, because I think that a lot of stories of individuals who were, um, you know, around at this time, studying medicine at this time, really trying to get, uh, you know, their foot in the door, were activists, were, were doctors, we, we don't have their stories on this day at this time, because they were tragically taken from us. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank you again. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. You. It's just really to great here. to have you. Yeah, yeah. Ken. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, and, and I hesitate to just sit here and, and, and compliment you for two hours, but I'm, I'm kind of fangirling right now because I just think you're an incredible person. It's so cool to have you as a member of our community. And, uh, and and something that I know is really near and dear to you, as you've mentioned, is your art. And you have so generously, alongside your community of Vet Art Now artists, you have decided to organize this incredible art auction that people can see on display at the AVMA conference uh, next month in Denver, of course. Of course, items are up for bid on our website, which I will link to in the show notes. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Ken and his community of veterinary artists have curated a collection of their paintings of animal art. And what Ken has so generously decided to do is put all of these works of art up for auction and donate all of the proceeds to the Street Dog Coalition so that we can help even more pets of people experiencing homelessness get the care that they need. So I'm so curious, Ken, can you tell us a little bit of um, a little bit about what kind of artwork can people expect to see on the website and how can how can listeners participate? Sure. Well, um, let me just go back and, and get, go into how this all came about. Maybe that yeah. will start with that. Yeah. And, uh, for those of you that probably aren't aware, but the Journal of Veterinary, uh, American Veterinary Medical Association has been publishing um, animal art on their cover since 1973. And um, it turns out it was going to be the 50th anniversary of that event this July. And so a group of us decided that we should um, acknowledge that 
Um, and we went through the thousand covers and found about 181 that were done by veterinarians or veterinary professionals in the community. And so we took those and have created a, a JAVMA art Jubilee art book that's going to be sold at the AVMA uh, online that features these, these uh, wonderful veterinary artists and their pieces. And at the same time, around, around the same time, um, several of my colleagues, uh, Jolie Kirvenston and, and John Bliska, created uh, what's called uh, the Vet Art Now group, which has started, to, it's on Facebook, and we are a group of veterinary artists just trying to come together and start to share our work. And we decided that we would have our first art show in conjunction with the Jubilee in Denver. And we reached out to our membership and we got about, um, I think, 18 or 19 artists that have agreed to participate. And the art is great. It, it's, it's, it's varied from um, horses and cows to um, uh, uh, mystical uh, options. Um, and uh, and so I would suggest if you're at all interested, go to that website. It's You can look it up by Vet Art Now uh, is one word and it will come up. Um, uh, Daria will put it on the on the uh, the, the chat as well and it's they're now available for uh to put place bids from anywhere around the world really uh, we're going to be showing it at the veterinary conference but but we're hoping that if someone finds something really interesting that they they take the, the time and, and and make a bid and and uh support veterinary artists you know we're 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 always taught about science and 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 uh and as i mentioned we weren't really taught about um spirituality in, in our veterinary school that's our own journey but a lot of us are also artists and we were artists as children um, um for myself I, I i i'll just tell the little story about my grandfather uh maternal grandfather john um taught me three things when i was uh, i think eight or nine he taught me um he gave me my first pet a goldfish so i got to learn about uh, nurturing and living an animal this led on to a whole life of animal uh, work he taught me how to paint by numbers. Um, uh, and during the uh, 60s, there was a whole movement of uh, you, you could get these kits and you could paint numbers. And I was just shocked that you could create this beautiful painting with dots of, of paint. So I, that was my beginning of my art, my art career. And then he also taught me about how to how to plant um, bean seeds. And I learned how to watch the, so I became very much, all three things became very powerful in my life. And I'm just so in, grateful to his his wisdom and, and mentorship um, because it really uh, pushed me to this place. And as for my art, of course, I went and did all my veterinary work and, and that sort of sidetracked my art. But then um, in the 90s, uh, I started uh, painting uh, more regularly. And I, I learned that I like to paint plein air where I just go to a scene, sit down and just paint it from that spot. And I especially love nature uh, work. I, I do a lot of work in in uh, the desert and in uh, Death Valley specifically, where I, I just am really attuned to that. And um, and so that was sort of, uh, and then of course I became a gardener as well. So my grandfather is with me every day. But um, as for the art, artists in the, our profession, we're, I'm, I realized as we created this, that there's quite a few artists, veterinary artists that are just starting to come out. You know, it's like coming out of the closet in a way to put yourself out there for people to appreciate, and they judge as well. That's just natural. And we hope we find that there's pieces that people really fall in love with and, and makes them think and about a specific animal or just about the art itself. And so um, we're hoping that this will be the first of, of uh, an annual event uh, where we, we promote uh, us as a group. And we were really, really happy to have chosen Street Dog Coalition. We just uh, felt that that you guys have been doing such an amazing work in the profession. I know that you uh, try to organize a, a volunteer event at every AVMA meeting in the city where they uh, is being held. And so I know this year in Denver, there'll be another event that allows veterinarians to go out and help the homeless population of Denver. And uh, we know the money is going to be well spent to help people that really need it. And, and um, so we're really grateful for what you do. Mm, thank you, Ken. And we're really grateful to have individuals like you and, and, and and I really appreciate you giving us all this incredible insight into your your past, your coming of age story, and how you found yourself. And um, and and maybe we can kind of end with this question: If if I'm you know I'm, I see a, a handful of people are tuning in live, so if you guys have a question, by all means, go ahead, chime in, let us know, just drop an emoji, say hello. We love hearing from you. And and I'm going to speak on behalf of all of our listeners and say. 
if someone is listening to this and they they like drawing, but they haven't really committed too much time to it, or they have a real big interest in helping animals and even becoming a veterinarian, and, and they're just resonating with every single aspect of, you know, what you're sharing and your passion, but they feel, but, but they're also kind of wrestling with their identity, right? And, and they, and, and I, I know so often it can feel like as we are navigating our gender identity or our sexual identity, and also trying to balance all of these interests, right? Such as art, such as helping animals, such as becoming an activist. Um, oftentimes it, 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 it kind of immobilizes us. It makes us feel like we can't do it all. So maybe we shouldn't do anything. Um, where I think, of course, doing some things as small as it might be could be not only instrumental to the movement, but a real key way of finding yourself and finding your voice. So if someone is listening to this and they are just like, wow, Ken is, Ken is where I want to be in my career. I want to be this interdisciplinary artist. I want to make an impact in my community, but I don't know where to start. What advice would you give an individual like that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard, you know, when we're when we're younger and we're trying to find ourselves. Um, I think finding like-minded people is, is surely the first step. And I think in, in this, today's modern world with the internet, it's pretty easy to do. And there's a lot, there's so many more resources. As I said, uh, in the veterinary community, there's the, the Pride Veterinary Medical Community, which is a great asset for all of us. Um, I would say, um, for me personally, what I, uh, you know, I've done, I would share in my, in my older wisdom is that nature therapy really helps you heal yourself too. I, I, for me personally, I did a lot of a vision fast going into the desert with the group called, um, um, uh, now I can't even think of the name, but uh, it'll come to me, a, a, a school, a, a school of lost borders. And, and you can look that up online and they take people out into the wilderness and you sit for uh, three or four days and nights alone without food, just and in those moments, you're actually able to clear your head, allow yourself to find out what's really important to you. And these are, and there's also a LGBT group that that they do that allows you then to share what you learn from nature, because nature is our best healer, but it's also our best best teacher. And so that's one thing that might be helpful to individuals that really are struggling with where they want to go in their life, but maybe uh, doing some nature work could help you help you find that uh, true passion um, that mm. you have. Yeah. I love that. I love that. There's nothing quite like um, going out, hitting the trails, sitting on a rock. Uh, and just closing your eyes and, and allowing all of the internal and external noise to kind of dissipate. I, I, I think that's such beautiful advice. And I've, I have found that when I do that, my, my inner spirit and my inner voice kind of emerges now that it feels safe to. All the noise kind of goes away and my values become very clear. And the, the, the next step forward um, just 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 becomes apparent to me when I do that. So I really appreciate the the simplicity of that that advice. As difficult as it is, right? It's the simplest advice that always that always feels like the hardest advice to take. And you could I could you could just go out on your own and go for walks in nature and and turn off your cell phone number one, and and oh, yeah. bring out bring out a question you know and 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 maybe go out with another person so that you can come back and then share what you both learn so you can mirror off each other because nature um, does bring, it has all the answers for sure. If we listen, you know, and it could be through animals, you know, you might come across animals on your journey that have lessons, or it could be uh, the wind or the trees. Um, so there's so much out there. And uh, so that's beautiful. Simple. Yeah. It's walk simple. Walk. When you say it like that, Ken, it is, it is simple indeed. Ken, I want to thank you so much for not only your, you know, your time and your talent and your generosity, but for, of course, taking the time to chat, to chat with us today. I can't wait to see you in person in Denver. It's going to be great. I know you and I are going to be communicating a lot in the lead up to, to our in-person art auction. And, um, and yeah, I think it's safe to say you are officially a personal hero of mine. And I just know that individuals listening to this episode are, are, you know, going to feel inspired and are going to feel activated and, and empowered. And, and I think that's, you know, what this is all about. So if you are listening to this podcast episode, or if you're tuning in live, 
go ahead and click on the link in the show notes to check out the art auction that that Ken is not only featured in, but has produced on behalf of the Street Dog Coalition. And of course, if you're going to be in Denver at the AVMA conference, then you can check out these art, these fantastic art pieces in person. And uh, and and I, they're just they're just mind blowing. I love them. I know Katrina and I are both going to be go, both going to be bidding on some pieces. She and I have been joking about. Um, doing a little bidding war between the two of us. We have our, we have our eyes on a lot of the same pieces. Oh. So <laughs> we'll That's see great. what happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I look forward to meeting you as well. And uh, I'm so glad that, uh, of what you're doing and how the street dog coalition is evolving and hopefully empowering a lot more of the veterinary community to stand up and, and help the part of our society that is really in, in need um, they don't need judgment. They just need uh, acknowledgement that they're a, a living person as well and that their animal is important to them. And uh, I, I hope that um, that uh, that that uh, momentum keeps going for you. So thank you, Ken. And I'm sure it will, especially with the support of of individuals like you. So thank you again so much, Ken, for your time. I'll, I'll let you go. And I want to thank our listeners for listening as well. And um, I'm sure you'll be hearing more from from Ken in 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 no time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Take care.